title is an agronomist's view of mycology in agriculture. So it's sort of taking mycology as a big general field and going, whoosh, this is what uh, I see, my view of how it fits into many aspects of agriculture. So who am I? I'm currently an affiliate of QUT in the Centre of Data Science and also affiliate of COFI, which is a Queensland Agriculture Alliance for Food and, um, no, sorry, Queensland Agriculture Alliance Institute. Uh, at UQ. Um, my first degree was in agriculture in the UK, you can probably tell. My second uh, was then a master's and after that I went overseas to Botswana, so I went to a very dry place. Then I did my PhD um, in America and then went back to Africa. So I'm actually trained as an agronomist at PhD level and partly stats, so my more recent work has been in statistics as well. Next slide please. So my early days were growing up in England and my mother lived in the left hand side there um, just for a while, not all the time. And that was quite a basic place. We had uh, beautiful um, walks in the country, villages with their little churches and churchyards with yew trees, which are very ancient. And this is just in here to remind me there's places like Arga Fen, which are actually, um, you know, they're pr primary woodland still. They've never been cleared. So there's beautiful places in the UK. Thank you. And of course, I um, learned to love uh, nature, the English woodlands. It's always moist in England. You get muddy feet. You have, you know, a wet room all the time. Beautiful um, toadstools. And Peter, when I took him to England, he couldn't believe that. He said, oh, I thought they were only in fairy stories. <laughs> Peter's my husband here. And then my favourite, one of my favourite things in the world is a bird's nest fungi. I just think they're marvellous. Thank you. So as the English, as you know, we love our English, full English breakfasts, the old mushrooms, field mushrooms, which we used to collect. And we love our warm beer, which obviously involves um, yeasts and thank you, hops. But what I loved about mycology, when I found the whole link between food production and, um, and agriculture, it can be either helping us or in a helpful way, or it can be destructive. So on the left here is uh, wheat rust, which is a, very severe disease of wheat and causes a lot of uh, yield um, decline and even failed crops. Over here, this is a, a pig rummaging for a truffle in an ancient, probably this is a Roman mosaic, and it shows us how long that we've been associated with eating beautiful mushrooms. Next, thank you. And another thing, I'm just, this is the background, I'm going to start soon into the main body of it, but this person, Dr. Richard Korf, I knew him at Cornell University. I went there as an exchange student for one year. I was very lucky to be able to do his introductory mycology. This is way back in 1981, so a long time ago. But um, he was a renowned mycologist. And one of the key things, we went on fungal forays. And that's how I grew to love fungal forays and the wide variety of fungi. Thank you. So my outline today is to remind us all what agriculture is. It's all about producing food, fibre, such as flax, uh, fodders, fuels for human and our animals. And what us agronomists like to think of is that whole, what, what is agriculture in terms of the crops? You've got the genetics by the environment, by management. And um, so that's really very much about the um, what, we, what involves, what's involved to be a crop scientist. And obviously you've got the positive elements of things where you've got things coming in from yeasts, coming in um, flavoring, uh, fermentation products, beers, bread, all of the positive side of mycology. But the other and the one of the most crucial sides is the diseases of crops where you've got rusts, mildews, bunts. And I'm gonna show just a few of these as we go through. And so crop husbandry really is crop management. And in particular, whoops. Um, this involves the control of pests and diseases. So when you want to control this, things like you can change the time of sowing, you can play, change the plant population so you have fewer plants or more plants, you can change the row spacing, you can have strip crops, you can change the cultivar. And the other aspect of plants, which is really the reason I put the stars here is I've worked a lot on water stress and in particular um, in sorghum in uh, Africa and Australia. So the stress is on the plants. You've either got heat stress, you can have water stress, but you can also have the dryness of the atmosphere or the wetness of the atmosphere. And those things can really affect the, the crops. And of course, the environment involves soils, it involves the weather, it involves soil water, weeds, pests, 
Uh, you've got nematodes and so many other. Thank you. So just to remind us that we've got many food production systems. And one of the things I love about agriculture is it's very much, if you like, like ecology, because it's not just the same all around the world. You've got the different environments, the different crops. You've got the different centers of diversity. And domestication occurred 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent. So you've got your wheats, your emmers, all of those um, lentils, some of those crops. And there's centers of diversity in Africa, in India, South America, where you have maize comes from South America. So all of these factors make agriculture so interesting. Um, and again, as I said, we've got this G by E by M, but what's important here, I always think, is we've got man involved. Man can make decisions so that we can try and make the best yields we can for feeding people. And one of the things that's important, um, I've talked about crop management and agronomy, but the plant breeders and the crop breeders have a very, very important role. And I'm not able to talk as a plant breeder, but they have a massive role to keep that fight between the pathogens um, on the crops and, um, and uh, you know, between us and famine, really. So the other thing I'd like to mention is integrated pest management, where you've got the integration of the biology of the crop, the biology of the fungi or the pest, and you try and use all of your knowledge and all of your, if you like, the tools that you've got, such as the um, cultivar, the timing, and even pest, pesticides such as fungicides to control so that you can get good yield. And so there's also modern disease management. And this moves into, I'm not going to mention much, just one aspect later on. Modern disease management is where you understand the genetics, the genomics of the plant, the genomics of the fungi. And it's that race between, you know, um, getting resistance and the crop being um, inundated by, um, you know, failing that resistance. So that's another very important um, part of agronomy. And so it involves uh, water plants, nutrients, which you hardly mentioned, removing weeds, but we have to protect our crops from diseases. And we've got viruses, we've got bacteria, uh, we've got bird. In Africa, you have to protect your uh, crop from bird scaring, by bird scaring if you've got sorghum or millet in the field. Um, and the other aspect, even further on, which is not my area at all, but is you've got the storage, the transport, the processing, the preparation, and you've got all that post-harvest loss where fungal degradation is also very, very important. Thank you. So look, what I do first of all, moving on, is to <laughs> talk about some positive aspects of mycology. This is sort of fun bit, so well, some of it's fun. Thank you. Moving on. <laughs> um, we've got all our products. So here we've got all our lovely grains. We've got millet, sorghum, uh, peas, legumes, um, barley, you can imagine. So many of our staple foods are from the grass family and many are from the leguminous family. So you've got all your lentils, your peas, beans, faba beans. They're all um, uh, legumes. Then we've got our horticultural fruits, nuts, cacao, banana, coffee. These are all international um, international internationally traded um, products and very valuable we've got trees I haven't even gone into that either you know the rubber we've got flax cotton cotton's a big one for pests in fact uh, insect pests is a big problem on cotton but with the grasses one of the big problems there is the disease the, the soil borne or the airborne diseases um, and then likewise food and transport thank you so uh, we've got yeast and beer uh, with bread as well so there's the bread and the beer up here, I've just popped in, I don't know if anyone's been to Southern Africa, Jabuku is a what they call a um, opaque beer from Africa, and they, they produce it, it's low alcohol, uh, and it's much better to drink it than when you've got infected water. But when they try and produce that and manufacture it, they can have problems with having the wrong strain of yeast or whatever, because it is a lower alcohol. It's not like um, maybe producing beers and wines where you've got more control over the alcohol content. So that's called, and the other reason it, I put it up there because it comes in these cardboard containers and you shake it, you call it shake, shake before you drink it. So it all gets up, um, the, it's like a gruel really. Thank you. And then tempeh, I just thought I'd mention this one. When I did that wonderful course at Cornell, we made tempeh. So we infected, um, we got some soybeans, which we'd um, cooked up and then you infect them with this fungus, rhizobus piece species. And then you layer it out and you ferment it and it grows, the mycelium grow through it and then you eat it afterwards. So I don't know if anyone's eaten it, but it's, it's quite nice. Yeah, and I haven't made it for years, but I did make it that time and it was lovely. So, you know, it only takes like three days to really 
um, grow into uh, tempeh at 30 degrees C. And the champignon, which I won't talk about, but there's loads of beautiful mushrooms that we enjoy. Thank you, next one. And write me your cheese, my absolute favorite. I love blue cheese. Uh, you've got the penicillium species and they give us the color, the flavor. And also when you think about penicillin, we've also got those beautiful um, antibiotics, which I know we sort of know can be problematic, but we should remember that that has actually um, helped mankind a lot too. And in fact, in agriculture, they have used it probably a little bit too much and I know they're cutting back, but antibiotics have helped in animal production to cut down on bacterial diseases. Thank you. And the last, I think this is my last positive thing, <laughs> is the microbial, uh, mycorrhizal symbiosis. So obviously this is where you've got your vascular plants and uh, the, uh, and I'm not going to go into much of this, I think we've had talks on these, but uh, there's a reference here, fairly recent one, talking about these um, vascular mycorrhizal fungi and their role and in fact that they actually improve um, phosphate nutrition and I think they think that's the case because the fungi are in the roots they're literally inside the roots and there's um, these uh, like arbuscular which are like little tiny sort of trees inside I think that's where it gets the name from arbuscular is like tree inside the cells and so when the mycelium go out into the soil they can actually bring in a much wider range of phosphorus for the plant and be very beneficial. Thank you. Diseases of crops. So this is the other side of fungi. So the rest of the talk's really about that side. And we've got, as I mentioned, international expansion of crops has, has occurred forever. I think the most recent uh, crop that's been um, introduced internationally is rubber. It's one of the most recently. But you can think back, and we all have heard of rye and the um, El St. Elmo's fire in uh, Western Europe. So this is the sclerotes of um, ergot in rye. And when you eat that, it is poisonous. Uh, likewise, you've got clonal crops such as banana. If you could just, just tap it, it's gonna bring up my potato. And I think one more, another tap. So your clonal crops such as banana and potatoes, they're identical. So if you get a disease into your, that's why potato famine was so dis, uh, destructive. It was a clonal crop just completely wiped out the Irish potato. Um, and then the same can happen with bananas with, um, I've forgotten the name of it actually. Is it Panama disease? I think it's a fungal one. Yeah, thank you. So I haven't really gone too much into this. I just wanted to remind us that there are different groups of fungi and we're actually can find examples of fungal pathogens of plants in all of the groups. And I'm not, as I said, I'm a generalist, I'm an agronomist, I'm not a mycologist. So one of the examples from the first group um, is potato wart disease. It's a wart disease on the tubers of potatoes and it's of that um, Chytridomycota group. Um, then you've got your, uh, I can't say this probably, glomeromycota, where you've got your AM arboscular um, uh, mycorrhizae species. And a lot of those are found in wetlands and the majority of sp plant species do have mycorrhizae. And then you've got your Ascomopota, which um, a lot of our diseases come from here. We've got plant pathogenic such as apple scad, rice blast, ergot, black knot, powdery mildews, and then uh, the Basidio mycota, which are also another group. So, and so this is just, it's not a particularly good um, picture, but it just reminds you that damping off diseases, you've got fusarium wilt and the other one, um, sorry, bactericillium, there's another one in my head, but okay, it doesn't matter. So the wilt diseases, these are soil-borne diseases that cause damping off or the seedlings die off in the soil, they're quite problematic, particularly in greenhouses, I think. Next one. Uh, and here we have the Ascomo uh, Cotter. Just to, with e even in a group, we've got like the truffles, but then we've also got these um, problems such as Dutch elm disease, chestnut blight, apple scab, and then we've got the yeast. So it's a real mixture of, you know, the groups have got both positive and negative um, members. Thank you. Next one. So here's our apple scab, and you can see that that would not sell very well if you get apple scab on your um, apples also causes problems on the leaf. And as, as we know, as soon as you get anything taken away from the green leaf, you're reducing your yield. And if you get anything taken away from something like a beautiful apple, you're gonna reduce, people aren't gonna to want to buy it. So what can you do with the things like this when you get plant diseases? 
you can um, have resistant varieties. You have to look after the hygiene, such as taking the, um, the fruit and the leaves under the tree. And you also have to maybe look at the way you prune to keep your canopy airy so you don't have such a problem with fungi. Next one. Rice blast, just showing you what rice blast looks like, a massive problem in the rice industry. And this is powdery mildews, white rust. Um, and all I've really done is here, not for you to read it all, but just to show you that we've got the, the factors conducive to spread. They, we, we think of fungi as being mostly wanting sort of moist conditions, but um, you know, even under milder temperatures, you've got the white blister rusts on the brassicas and so on. High humidity, you have the, um, the downy mildews on many of our uh, greenhouse crops and uh, horticultural vegetables. And then the powdery mildews, which are on a slightly drier type of um, environment. But again, they cause massive problems. And I've definitely had powdery mildews in, um, on my cucurbits in my garden. They just sort of just wipe out the crop. Next one. Then we have the smuts. And what happens here is with the smuts, they mimic the pollen. The, the um, spores are able to actually go into the stigma and grow. And instead of a, a grain forming, you end up with these sclerotes um, that form. And not only are they um, you know, taken away from the yield, but if they get into the feed, they are um, very toxic to humans and in particular to um, livestock. So have the next one. I just put this up about sorghum because we think of um, maybe our disease problems being you know, fixed, they're not. In 1996, which is since I've been in Australia, this fungus has come in and become a problem in sorghum. And uh, you can see it's, it damages the crop and that uh, the fungus is the source of this LSD-like component, which is actually very toxic. So if you have sorghum as an animal feed, which is largely is in the West, in America and in um, Australia, of course, in Africa, they use this as a, a, a food crop, as a staple. So it will affect your animal feed and it will also affect farm economics in a massive way. And of course, the breeders then have to start looking at it. I've just got a couple of slides to even tell you a little bit about there's some, um, there's some uh, rusts out there or there's some fungi that have two hosts. And that's very complicated as well. I haven't got the life cycle, cycle up here, but you can see there's this um, is a fungi that uh, grows on the red cedar, which is in the Cupressaceae family. And the other host is in the Rosaceae family. So they're completely different plant families. They have this life cycle of going between the, um, the two species and they have very different symptoms in each plant. So there's another one, an example. This one is one that I was <coughs> first aware of. I just found out that one recently. But this one, um, when I was living in America, they never had black currants or Ribena. And I used to think that's interesting. But one of the reasons is black currants are not grown in America because they really value their, um, <laughs> let that be. <laughs> I may not be able to answer on everything, obviously. <laughs> but black currants are not grown in North America uh, because of this two host life cycle and they cut it by not having the, the second species. Because I'm not exactly, I'm sorry you can't read this very well, but it's just to tell you that there's two hosts and obviously you get the asexual or the sexual. And as soon as you get into that sexual side, you're going to be making a lot of uh, variations and more likely that it might spread into a wider um, plant base. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> There's not much more, by the way. <clears throat> OK, go to the next one. Yeah, so the other thing is we talked about um, how fungus are often on um, plants that are, you know, um, moist or they get dew on the leaves, all of that sort of thing in greenhouses. So the way you water can even make a difference. Um, but so they're usually um, sort of found under moist conditions. And then you have to think about when you're look, thinking about control, you also have to think about the source of the fungal infections, because obviously the um, spores are tiny. 
And so they, you can get the infections from seed, soil, crop debris, nearby crops, and even weeds, because you can, do get weeds at the same, uh, like graminae, you've got to, uh, wild sorghums, and if they're near and they have diseases, it can go into the crop and so on. Uh, and the other thing you have to think of is how are they spread? And a lot of them, the airborne fungals are spread by wind and water splash. And again, they can get moved through contaminated soil, animals, workers, machinery, tools, seedlings, other plant material. And you can imagine, for instance, out in the Lockyer Valley, I've worked out there with some of the uh, bean growers. And if they are moving their equipment and they get us a disease on a, a, on a paddock, and then they move their equipment to other regions, that's going to spread. So you do have to really think about these sorts of things when it's all very well trying to just um, simplify or go monoculture bigger and better. But there's a lot of things that we really need to consider because we should be really considering um, how to control and uh, mitigate the spread of this plant disease. I think there's a, maybe one or two more. Not many. Yeah, so really, um, I, I guess this was me thinking about what the economics of plant disease, you might think it's not worth controlling. So really husbandry is your plant management. And as I said before, it also involves that control of disease. So is it, is it economically viable to breed for resistance? And there was a um, reference here that I found fairly recent. And they were looking at Paxinia, which is um, a rust of uh, wheat, Drutium acevum. And they looked at um, over a long period of time in America, and even when they overstated or they thought they were being very conservative in their costs, they said the benefits, the internal rate of return on, of capital invested was 13%, well in the range recommended for us previously uh, projects by the World Bank. So it really is worth investing in um, controlling our plant disease. And yeah, so our traditional disease management has been all of these types of things. Um, and you can see that they all are relevant for fungi. You've got avoidance, so you can plant early or plant late and things like that. Um, you can exclusion, you can prevent the inoculum, but again, that gets increasingly difficult with movement of tractor, movement, even movement of um, people. I don't think they even know how ergot got into Australia, the sorghum ergot. I haven't heard how it got in, but it must have come in somewhere. And when they bring in plant disease, plant breeding materials, they do have to quarantine them and often grow them out and then um, have the seed from them. Um, so you can exclude the inoculum. Then you've got eradicating the inoculum. Like they used to burn fields. They're not doing that as much now, but they did used to burn the wheat fields in the UK. Well, you do see we weeds in your garden. I mean, um, do have fungal diseases on them. I know there's some powdering mildews on some of the weeds in my garden. But you have to be careful because if it's a relative of a crop or another plant, it could just as likely move. Although a lot of the um, sort of obligate parasites are very specific. So you've got, you know, your wheat's got your wheat rusts and things like that. And if you go into a lot of detail, there's even strains like there we see our flus, you know, there's different strains that, that can attack. So yes, uh, I mean, your, your weeds can get affected by plant, um, by, by fungi diseases. I guess it is an option, but I just say to be a bit cautious. <laughs> Thank you for that though. That's a, that's a good point. If you look, I can't remember what the, the species is I get, but it definitely gets affected by powdery mildew. Um, yeah, protection. So, so you can use toxicants. For instance, uh, the, the, the insect fungi can sometimes be sprayed to take care of um, insects. So you're using a fungus, spraying it on to get to stop a pest. And I think Diana Lemon's very done a lot of work in that area. So there's definitely work in that. It's more sort of like a secondary um, example rather than directly on the fungal diseases of crops. Um, and then resistance, this is the really big one. And our plant breeders, I used to go to um, a, a yearly meeting on Bribey Island for all the sorghum agronomists and sorghum people in research in Queensland. Half of us were agronomists, plant crop modelers and things like that. Half were plant breeders because plant breeding for resistance to um, disease or 
reducing, it's not fully resistant sometimes, is a very massive amount of um, research money goes into it and needs to, to be honest. Um, so this is very important. And if anyone's interested, you can get an amazing career in plant breeding. They can work all over the world with those things. Um, and then cure your plants. So that's not very easy to cure a, plant, a leaf that's been infected by fungus. My next one, please. We're nearly there. <laughs> yeah, so I just popped up here. That this, this is sort of a little bit of a summary in a sense. There's a very important role of, of plant breeding. And for instance, I just looked at this this afternoon to just see what they're doing in the UK for wheat, because wheat's a big problem, has a lot of problems with um, various uh, fungal problems. So we've got mildew, yellow rust, brown rust, septoria, eye spot, fusarium, um, ear blight, and then a midge. So this is a, a, obviously an insect, but the disease resistance is rated. And when they give these you know, big lists of varieties every year, they'll rate them for disease. So if you know you're gonna plant in a particularly uh, susceptible time of year, or in a particularly, um, maybe a, a wet field or something, you can choose your level of resistance that you want for that particular um, winter wheat. And there's a lot of work that goes into making these, these lists every year. They're actually done by growing them out in the field and checking them. Um, and of course, it's a, it's a real race between the resistance being overcome by the fungus and then producing a new resistance. So every year in these lists, there'll be some of the older varieties will be dropped off because they've lost their resistance and some new ones coming in. And I just wanted to sort of emphasize the fact that people don't necessarily realize how much work goes into this fight against uh, crop disease. Um, and it's, it's very, very important. And the other thing is, this is my last picture slide. I did a course called Physiological Plant Pathology, which was very, very interesting. This was back at Y College in the UK. And we looked at the mechanisms of how fungi gets into the leaf, what happens, and how does it react to the pathogen. And you've got this hypersensitivity reaction that you can get. So the mycelium goes into a cell. And if you just uh, give me the next one, even though it's infected, that cell dies. And so because the fungus is a uh, obligate parasite, it needs a living cell, it can't grow. So this is the sort of thing you'll get when you get this le level of hypo resistance in crops. And you can see if you've got that, yes, you've got a few dots of um, yellow, but you're not losing that photosynthetic tissue because what you need with crops is to photosynthesize, capture that and make yield from it. So. So that's um, a very interesting, and I learned all about that. It was very, very interesting course, but very, very, um, yeah, lots of different mechanisms and ways that everything worked and, and they do use it. I think that's nearly my last one, she says. <laughs> oh, aflatoxins. Yes, I thought I'd put this in because I looked this up because I thought, oh, I haven't got anything about aflatoxins. Of course, they're um, basically on feed um, materials. So, and I learned this myself. I didn't even know about this. But in 1960, there was this disease called Turkey's X disease and over 100,000 turkeys died in the UK and they worked out why. They did some feeding studies to find out why they died. And they found that there was this ground nut meal, which is obviously peanut meal, came in from Brazil and it was extremely toxic. And it's all to do with this fungus Aspergillus flavus. And you've got all these different compounds and I'm sure it's a lot more complicated than this. You've got various compounds, aflatoxins, and they are, very significant in that they can contaminate um, peanuts. Uh, so in Africa, again, you go, you go around, I lived in Africa and they sell peanuts, but it's not a good idea to buy them and eat them because they've often got aflatoxins, East Africa and uh, Southern Africa. Um, so people would probably get stomach, stomach aches and get sick, but they don't really realize necessarily why. Uh, it's in maize, it's in groundnut, quite a few different crops. And you'll often see there'll be a, something on the news where you've, they've had a big aflatoxin um, problem in, in some um, grain that is traded internationally. So it's, there is a concern for it. And I think we do have to be careful on that. Um, okay, next one, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so basically there's all these interesting things. One thing I could highlight is that there's always a tropical agricultural conference every couple of years in Brisbane. Um, by coffee and I've seen some amazing um, talks at there there some of you here probably know about that so you learn about what the threats are in Australia or internationally for our crops 
Um, some of the big ones for disease are bananas, wheat, cassava. Um, and the effect of climate on all this, you know, who knows? It's just going to get worse, probably. And I think that's the last one. Yeah, any questions? That's just. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And um, yeah. Are there any questions? Yes. I'll have to repeat your question for the people online is just to be mindful. So the question was regarding um, endophytes and exploring options with endophytes in crops. Is that correct, Fran? Um, I, I haven't done any myself um, and I'm sure there are some done out there, but with the work that I was doing, we were very much focusing. And of course, I guess the other thing to, to mention is that when you've got water stress, it's usually dry, you've got a dry atmosphere and you can have endophytes in the soil, but I think what people have been doing in terms of the agronomy side or the mechanisms of, of water stress have been to find out how does the plant itself cope with having, is it, how can we get a more efficient plant itself um, in that condition? So, because if you're going to take that um, knowledge or get, get some experiments in that area to do, to ensure that they've all got the same, um, because we do our big experiments in big pots and in the field, and so I think it would be quite difficult, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I think we should try it as well. But the way we have approached it is to actually look at what's the transpiration. We call it TE, the transpiration efficiency of the actual plant without having any evaporation from the soil. So it's a very specific thing we have to measure, and it takes a lot of money to do those trials. And that's really where my focus has been. And I'm not as aware of the, the ones, although I do think um, they are implicated into being useful because they do extend out the, the system of roots. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, I, when I say I'm an agronomist, I, I wasn't brought up in, sorry, I wasn't brought up on a farm and I, I really have to call myself a research um, agronomist because I've always ever done stuff in, um, well, I've done it in fields, in greenhouses, in uh, rain out shelters, any, any type of imagined, I've, I've done those sort of trials. But the, as I said, the difficulty with doing, I think, experiments on that, I think you, you can definitely do surveys and it should be, we should be surveying and finding out what's, what's in those, um, those fields. But a lot of the work we do is it's the precision, I feel, that is, is difficult sometimes. Because when we, as I said, the work that I was doing in terms of, we did identify a, a sorghum that was 10% more efficient. We looked at different um, genotypes. And I, I get very frustrated being an agronomist because I get fed up or frustrated with everybody thinking that plant breeding is going to answer the problem because I don't think it will there's the management side and I totally agree that I think the fungal side is very important but it's a very hard to um a to get funding for it and also to actually do those trials and because you want your trials to be sort of applicable for you know big areas no I, I don't think they don't believe it though to be honest but I, I I do think it's um important but I think it's it's trying to get that evidence and how do you then you know, do you inoculate or how do you get it out to farms? What would you suggest? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think, you know, we have moved away a lot with a lot more now of the, um, you know, the no-till and some of those things. We have moved away a lot from just plowing things up and wrecking our soils. And, and I've worked a lot in, I didn't mention, but I have worked uh, years in Africa. And um, that was interesting as well, because again, it was very, very dry. Um, and we had to do things, you know, quite differently there. And, and the problem is, I guess, as well, fungi, they do usually um, prefer moisture conditions. So when it's really, really dry, I don't know, you know, you'd have to work out ways of su survey surveying for them, I guess, if you like. Uh, no, I don't disagree with you. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, if you have a particular fungal, um, say, pathogen, whether it could have a positive effect somewhere else and a, um, whereas it might be negative in another place in another plant it's really to do if you had um, I'd say one thing is whether it is uh, the level of susceptibility of a plant you can have this hypersensitivity so if you had a hypersensitive plant and you know that would survive and be fine that sort of interaction um, usually you sort of really probably don't want to have um, the fungal infections because of the fact that they can mutate and change and if you spray then you're pushing that whole infection um, probably for towards you know getting resistant so the question was around um, soil health and the importance of soil health and what research has been done around that um, 
I guess really I can't say that I have much experience of that, but I do know that the way we're changing the way we do agriculture in terms of, um, you know, not disturbing the soil and not eroding the soil and um, maybe not spraying as much, although glyphosate gets sprayed all over the place, doesn't it, really? Um, and I do think, you know, our vision on looking after diversity within agriculture as well as outside of agriculture is important, so that will help, I think. But I, that's all I can really say in general terms, I think. Yeah, the question is regarding, uh, that's okay, ergot in sorghum, does all the grain get affected? And I'm thinking all the grain within a head. I don't know if that was your question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it, uh, an ergot would actually, the ergot on sorghum is a different species than an ergot on wheat and, and so on. And the main thing we've tried to do at the moment is keep ergot out of countries. It is in some places and, and breed, breed for resistance. I think that's one of the reasons they produced triticale in the Europe was that which is uh, rye and wheat because it was resistant to ergot because ergot was a problem but not every grain gets infected but the trouble is as soon as it gets into your bins and your feed system and your supply chain it gets there doesn't it so but a lot of I mean the rusts and all of those uh, graminaceae um, fungal diseases are usually very very specific um, on, the, on, a, on a particular species. And then there's this sort of race to overcome resistance between, and that was something that would be lovely to have a whole talk on that because I'm not sure of, um, you know, what the current status of it is. I know they do a lot of work on resistance. And in America, they were doing a lot of work on what they called multi-lines, where instead of just planting one cultivar, you might mix, say, four or five different cultivars and so you've got different um, levels of susceptibility so even if some of them died some of them wouldn't die from fungal infection but um, it's a continual race and I think it's a very important area where we should not forget because it's you know our food production that's getting destroyed by fungi as much as I love fungi <laughs> I do love them as you know thank you <laughs> I think it was conditions as well I think it was must have been very moist very wet and of course and of course, because the other thing is the potato is a clone. Every single potato in there is, is the same. And the leaves just, you know, were too, completely blighted. And of course, the other thing about potato diseases on the potato itself is it's a very high water content. So you do get a lot of fungal diseases on anything that's moist. <laughs> so and I, I think the other thing is potatoes were very much the staple crop. They didn't have anything else much. They were just eating one crop. And even though it's, um, you know, that, that's why they, there was a famine, but Potatoes themselves actually have about 6% protein, so they, you can live on potatoes. It's not that you can't, it's just that they were completely dependent on them, and then there was famine, so, yeah, thank you. Okay, I might stop, shall I? <laughs> thank you very much, though. Thank you, Miranda. That was simultaneously fascinating and terrifying, but it was really good stuff, so thank you very much, and thank you, everyone online, for being a part of this.